hear me, I trust. All right, that's good. Um, my name is Mitchell Jackson. <laughs> Don't <laughs> that. That's my mama's doing. Um, I'm a writer. Uh, and um, even more so, maybe, I'm a fan um, of the person who we will hear read and the person I get to have a conversation with, Johnny the White Man. Yeah, yeah. Said this before, but I'll tell y'all that I, I use my middle initial S, Mitchell S. Jackson, when I publish because John uses his whole name. <laughs> True story. Um, if I were to uh, give you a standard bio with all of John's accolades on it, we probably wouldn't have time for a conversation. So I will tell you that John Edgar Weidman is a two time winner of the Penn Faulkner Award. He's a MacArthur genius. He's a Lannan uh, Lifetime Achievement winner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's been nominated a finalist for the NBCC, the National Book Award. Um, but more so, John Edgar Whiteman is one of our greatest living writers. That's inarguable. Um, <clears throat> I met John in the summer of 2003 in New York. Uh, I was at NYU, New York University, and they were teaching, uh, he was teaching a workshop. And I wanted to take the workshop, but I didn't have the money to take it. So I finagled my way into the workshop. And about midway through our 10-day workshop, I pulled John aside. I'm like, hey, man, uh, I didn't have the money to take this, but I'm really hoping that you, know, you can be some form of a mentor to me after this is over. John looked at me, he was like, man, brother, uh, you know, I got my own work to do. I got my own students. I fly off to France in the summers, and, uh, you know, I would love to help you, but I, I just don't think that's in the cards. So next day I went home and I wrote a story for the workshop. Uh, it was called Each One, Teach One. <laughs> and the story was about a older writer who refused to mentor <laughs> a younger writer. And uh, then the next day, John had to introduce the people who were giving the readings of those stories in the workshop. So he gets up, and this is Mitchell. He's in my workshop. He's going to read a story. He don't know what the story is. I'll read the story. In true John Edgar Whiteman fashion, I named my protagonist John. And uh, what I will say is that John and I had a conversation uh, sometime during or right after that workshop in that he has been some form of a mentor or a measure for me since 2003. And I am very, very thankful for that. Uh, John is going to come out and give you all a reading from his latest work. I've already read it. Hopefully you will read it too soon. Uh, and I'm really excited to have a conversation with him. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I can't exactly see you, but I can hear you. And I'm happy to be here. I forgot about High Plains country, that it gets cold at night, almost every night. I lived in Wyoming for many years, uh, even higher uh, country than this is. And I should have known better, but I have a short sleeve shirt. So um, I, don't, I didn't write any uh, trembles or any shivers into this particular piece, but there, there may, some may occur. Uh, and, you know, spontaneity. Um, I'm gonna go right into a reading. I'm looking forward to having a conversation with Mitchell. And I had a couple of things that were on my mind that I 
thought about reading for you. And I thought I'd read the one that is most difficult, that will require the most attention. But I don't think, uh, I hope it's not a strain. There are a lot of names, but it should make sense to you. But it's an important story to me, and that's why I'm choosing, choosing to read it. I'm working on a new book, and the book is called Slave Road. And one of my options was to read a story that tried to explain what I meant by slave road, a single word. Um, and I thought, no, I don't want to explain anything to all these intelligent people. Um, what I want to do is share something that is still mysterious to me, which I'm still trying to figure out and give them the opportunity to figure it out with me. So the story is not going to be called Slave Road. It's not the beginning of that new novel, but it's part of the new novel. And Slave Road itself is not exactly a novel. That's part of the puzzle. You, as a reader, I hope, as you go through this book, will figure out for yourself what it is. And maybe you'll figure, well, it's not exactly fiction. It's not exactly autobiography. What the hell is it? Uh, is it short story, poems? Maybe it's all those things. And maybe literature has something to do with uh, learning for ourselves, each one learning for ourselves what language can do, what books can do, what words can do, anyway. This is a piece that comes towards the end of this new book, Slave Road. It's called R.I.P., as in R.I.P. <laughs> William Henry Shepard, a man of partly African descent, born in Virginia towards the end of the 19th century, became a Presbyterian missionary and lived 20 years in Africa before he returned to America and died in Kentucky in 1934. And sometimes I talk to him the way I talk to you, bro. Ask him questions about his life to help me make sense of mine. Recently, I shared the good news with William Henry Shepard that you, Rob, my youngest brother, my only surviving male sibling, have been released from prison after serving 44 years of a life sentence. Told William Henry Shepard that 29 years ago, while you were still locked up, your son, Omar, was murdered. During my brother's incarceration, I tell Shepard, my father, my brother, excuse me, during my brother's incarceration, I tell Shepard, my brother fathered a second son. And that son named Chance, because no conjugal visits legal in Pennsylvania prisons, and thus a very small chance indeed conception might occur in the random rare 25 to 30 minutes of privacy a couple could beg or bribe a guard to provide. Chance, his first name, and Mandela, his second name. Named Chance Mandela because not only did my brother's son manage to get conceived, he also chose to be born the very day Nelson Mandela released after 23 years in a South African prison. And I tell William Henry Shepard that Chance Mandela, my youngest brother's son, my nephew, and half-brother of dead Omar, has just sent me a beautiful photo of himself, his wife, and their infant son they named Josiah Omar. 
So it goes on this slave road. I admire the family photo, touched by it. Recall Rebecca's family, the Protons, Rebecca and her spouse, Christian, and their daughter, Anna Maria, smiling in a family portrait painted three centuries ago by Johann Valentin Haidt. Christian Jacob Proton, Rebecca's husband, the troubled father of his family, our soul, brother, brother Rob, yours and mine, and shepherds. Proton, who shares the name Jacob with my imprisoned son. Jacob Proton of mixed African and European descent, as was his wife, Rebecca. Both of them Moravian missionaries, travelers, wanderers, who spent time in Europe, the West Indies, Africa. Christian Jacob Proton, born in Africa, educated in Europe, returning after decades abroad to serve as chief teacher and chaplain at Fort Christianborg on the West African coast. A scholar, a published author and translator, one of the first to transcribe Ga and Fanti so those languages could be read and written as well as heard. Proton, also a philanderer, a notorious drunk, punished for his immoral behavior by a Presbyterian church that turned a blind eye on the fact that the slave trade supplied most of its African converts. His European colleagues considered Proton a dreamer, too full of arrogance, self-conceit, like Shepherd. two centuries later. He was praised, denounced, hounded because too colored or not colored enough for those who deemed him colored. And so it seems to go eternally, on and on, lives on a slave road crossing the Atlantic, lives and deaths our families endure, lives and deaths and stories like yours, bro, that seer, brand, Fill me with love, remorse, shame, anger, pride, a longing to be in many places, many times, many bodies, carried away with them, returning here to find they have never left, never gone away, not waiting somewhere for me to come join them, but here where I'm with them, here where I speak to them, and yearn for them to speak on and on. Like the day I encounter drippy purple letters spelling R-I-P Omar, scrawled in the top left corner of a frozen puddle of paint that stands upright so it's like a gate or door, an eight foot tall, 10 foot wide puddle of graffiti on a black metal canvas within the gray metal frame, situated in front of a steel barrier, an iron railed fence where the pedestrian walkway across Williamsburg Bridge divides. R.I.P. Omar appearing there where I must choose if I intend to proceed beyond the movie screen of embedded graffiti to go either right or left either a double lane ramp designed for foot traffic or the other lane designed for bikes. At that juncture in the walkway, approximately a fifth of the way across Williamsburg Bridge in New York City, if you start at Delancey Street, where I do, you may discover, as I did, R.I.P. Omar, freshly painted on a placard, erected a century ago by the city of New York's Department of Bridges. A memorial the department intended to celebrate and commemorate completion of a monumental undertaking, the construction of the Williamsburg Bridge, but serving now as a billboard for any scribbler who decides to paint 
or tag or splash or inscribe or illustrate or decorate or deface it with piss or shit or spit or whatever, adding another layer to the many, many impacted layers that bury the memorial's original embossed letters deeper and deeper. Me thinking when the message R.I.P. Omar appears first on Williamsburg Bridge that I need you, my brother, my youngest brother, here, and thinking here he is on this bridge as I think of him and try to think what he might be thinking as each brother nods silently to himself and nods at the other thinking, no, not R.I.P. No, no, never, never R.I.P. Nodding, no, no, as if each brother's long, long thought visible to the other brother, endured by the other while we nod, nodding, no, never, not gone yet. Do not rest in peace, Omar, not now, not here on this metal gate, this painted door of no return, encountered, passed by while I crossed Williamsburg Bridge. It nods at us and we nod and perhaps stare back at it, but the door, the gate never opens or closes. It nods quietly forever without movement, always neither open nor shut, except if two brothers daydream it could or should connect what's already over and done to whatever comes next. Connect us, please, we are thinking, I think. Connect us to the empire of Omar. No empire ever rests in peace, does it? Although each and every one falls. Resiquat in pace. Three Latin words whose initials R-I-P are imported into English and translated in English vernacular as rest in peace. The letters R-I-P carved on European tombstones begin to appear from about the eighth century onward. For speakers of English, rip also a verb, meaning to cut, tear apart, or tear roughly away, or a noun, something that results from being torn or split apart. Omar, a Muslim name, signifying flourishing, long lived, like the Caliph Umar, instrumental in the rise of Islam. Um, an Arabic word for life. Average life expectancy, 76 years for an Omar born in the U USA in 2004. My youngest, last live brother's son, Omar, born in 1972, died in 1993. How many years ripped from Omar's life expectancy by a hail of assassin's bullets? Um, considered by many ancient philosophical texts to be the sound of the universe. All other sounds carried within it, om. In Sanskrit, om called pravana and means to hum, a hum considered unlimited and eternal. But can a black boy be an empire, an emperor? Are black boys assassinated or simply offed, executed? Murdered, lost, wasted, blown away. Each person, each of us greedy, relentless as empire. Each empire greedy, relentless as a person. Empire consumes people. People consume empires. Roman, Chinese, Turkish, Portuguese, American, Daomian, Gold Coast, Slave Coast, Elmina, are empire's doors 
of no return. I rendezvoused once with Omar at the Big Sears department store in East Liberty in Pittsburgh that used to take up a whole block of Highland Avenue, not far from Peabody High, my old school, also on Highland Avenue. School gone now like Sears. Peabody High, where our sports teams were Highlanders. Our logo, a guy in a skirt playing a bagpipe. Highlanders, a lame-ass, embarrassing name compared to Bulldogs, our nasty arch rivals at Westinghouse High. Back home in the Berg, paying a visit for my empire in Philly, empire of comfortable townhouse in a row of townhouses adjacent to Green Clark Park near University of Pennsylvania's campus, my first marriage still intact, my university teaching job with its perks and status and security and salary and copious time off, basically unfathomable to my mostly barely scuffling by or worst relatives I loved but whom I didn't want to think about too much. Couldn't think about because I'd have to admit and cope with the vast distance between us that had gradually become unfathomable for me. But clearly, that early September, with me home a couple days until my fall semester duties commenced, clearly, since next to impossible for anyone else in the immediate family to find the money quickly, legally, thus, clearly, no doubt about it, my turn to buy Omar a winter coat and clearly a stranger to my nephew, Omar, who takes a while to raise his eyes from the sidewalk or whatever it is he studies down there between the cracks instead of meeting my gaze, especially when I try speaking directly to him. Soft brown eyes like yours, my brother, like mine. My eyes Omar scrupulously avoids as I avoid long, hard looks at my Pittsburgh people. Which one of us a stranger, a grown-up? Which one an irrelevancy to the other? Him large for his eyes, age, man size at 13, growing, growing, gone. Sleeves of jacket he wears expose wrists, I bet. Ohm already prowling, I guess, to make his way in that darkness, that labyrinth, that limbo he must enter to escape Omar, earn Omar, own Omar. Winter coat or jacket or both purchased that day for Omar. Boy needed both, didn't he? And I could afford both, couldn't I? Afford more, ashamed to pretend otherwise. Ashamed in the eyes of my family if I could or couldn't. Wouldn't my three kids be wearing good winter coats when wind howled and snow fell in Philly? Does winter in Philadelphia ever swirl and almost blow you over the way it used to kick butt in that wind tunnel of Highland Avenue after we crossed Penn Avenue fall and winter when I, then my brothers and sister, humped daily to Peabody High to save bus fare nobody could afford? A long way round, school a million miles away maybe, but worth it, our mother said. Said anything better, she said, than that lousy rat trap, worthless, ignoramus Westinghouse High she'd attended her own self back in the day when at least they taught students penmanship, the neat, legible hand she still possessed. Your father and me breaking our behinds to keep us in this neighborhood, on this street, crowded up in this teensy house so you all can go to Peabody, but worth it if you all do right and get your education, she said. But Ohm never heard mom preach and fuss at us. Really no choice anyway for Omar, born and raised in Homewood, 
in Hazelwood, no choice but Westinghouse High, never got out the hood, out those Homewood, Hazelwood woods, you could say if you had nothing nicer to say than trying to be funny. But ohm not wild like me, my brother once mused to me after Omar gone. Mom having a fit the whole time, but I love the year we moved from Shadyside and I had to go to Westinghouse, my brother said. Love those crazy house niggers. Love the crazy nigger in me when I was in the house. Stone dug the house till I got myself too busy smoking, making money, and had to quitchuate my ass out of there. But Ohm, Ohm just did his time. Never in no bad trouble. Least none I knowed about. None but the little bits I remember his mom cried over when she visited me in prison. Seemed like Omar walked into Westinghouse High School one morning and four years later, Omar walked out. Didn't bother nobody. No teachers on his case. Nobody bothered him, except maybe a couple of them fresh, pesty girls claiming he the daddy. No education about it, but what you expect. House same as house always been. You sit there neat and quiet for years, mouth shut, mind your own business. They give you that paper and off you go. Ain't learn shit, but shit. Street's gonna teach you soon enough. Teach you to be a fool if you a fool like me. But own different, needed a different me. And swear to God, it hurts me. Breaks my heart and hurts me more than I can say. And wouldn't even try to say, big bro. Except I know you already know how goddamn pitiful sorry I am. I wasn't around, wasn't that different person poor Ohm needed. Ohm be alive today, maybe. Daddy to them little kids he left behind. Grown-ups now I tries my best to keep up with since I've been out the joint, but I'm getting too goddamn old. One miracle is that despite 44 years of imprisonment, you, the youngest of my three brothers, remembers freedom. I believe nobody grants a person freedom. A person must remember freedom. How did you? How do you remember, little bro? How does Omar? How does he stay alive? I am wondering as I get close, as close as I can get to the letters of his name, close to someone's wish that Omar rest in peace, slap dashed here of all places, here in New York City, where of all places I find myself one day and find myself needing to approach a tombstone taller than me, tombstone of steel and paint surprising me so much first time I see it bearing Omar's name and RIP, I had to lower my eyes and pass by in silence, concentrate on going either right or left on Williamsburg Bridge because the walkway divides and if you want to reach the walkway's termination in Williamsburg, you must choose one way or the other after you have traversed perhaps a fifth of the bridge's length and find yourself here where anonymous officials, all probably white men in suits, all probably dead by now, chose to plant a black steel placard framed within gray steel of the bridge's steel soil to mark and memorialize completion of a task they've been assigned, a formidable piece of work accomplished, not necessarily this destined to last forever, they probably knew, though last thing they probably understood, perhaps a good while longer than they would. And perhaps that possibility a bit satisfying for dead people once oblivion swallows them. But on the other hand, perhaps they, those white men, would be very surprised 
to see the bridge today, unsettled maybe by the volume of streaming traffic beneath the walkway, new skylines of towers, needles, mile after mile of 100-acre-sized high-rise warrens in rows visible from up here, the ceaseless roar, and the officials might shyly, overwhelmed a bit by terror and incomprehension, drop their eyes and get on with whatever business occupies their time now, not exactly grateful and not exactly ungrateful either to have something else to do other than look surprised, stunned, unsettled as I was first time seeing my nephew suddenly appear here, my nephew shot and killed 20 years ago in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on November 8th, 1993, while his girlfriend, their baby in her arms, stood screaming at the top of stairs leading up to her apartment. Omar appearing on Williamsburg Bridge, seeing him again, seeing Om, your son, my nephew, his name painted here, and me stunned and wondering, seeing your long lost son's name, then seeing him and seeing his name again next time I walked across the bridge, then once more, then painted over, then slopped back on again, red instead of purple paint in the same upper left-hand corner of a graffiti-coated metal canvas until one day I am driven to step closer, step to the very edge where the walkway deadens before it divides where a chin-high iron fence and 10-foot-tall steel barrier stand behind the steel-framed commemoration of the builder's success. There, here, I search only inches from vastness of empty air beyond barrier and fence, gripping the fence while I inspect impacted layers of graffiti, crusting a black steel cage. My foot braced, I lean over the memorial placard's edge as close as I can get to it, free hands scraping off snow and ice and whatever else flakes away as I try to read whatever else might be there to read, whatever else is there along with Om, there like Om, not resting in peace, because Omar does not rest in peace, does he, my brother? Too cold a February day for even my gloved hands to dig very deep into layers of frozen paint frozen iron, brass, steel, but a revelation revealed anyway up that close and personal to a wannabe tombstone, to a wannabe grave, to painted letters mourning and grieving as if no Omar anymore. Below the memorial's bottom edge, a gap of maybe a foot or so extends from one supporting leg of the placard to the other. And in this space, this gap, this opening below the placard, you'd be unlikely to pay any attention to unless you happen to wind up precisely, precariously, where I stand. The revelation of Omar is tagged atop a steel beam that connects the memorial's legs. Omar in white paint this time, a tiny secret tag on a black steel beam, and then another tag, and another, and another, forever. Tags far too small for eyes to see. Invisible tags I read one after the other, and then I see him, see Omar. I see my nephew, Om, again. Here's another one of my long thoughts, you may also think, bro. Freedom perhaps means a person has no choice, but chooses anyway. Freedom, an empire. Freedom, the cell you are born in and die in. Freedom born when you are born, dies when you die. 
imprisons you. Freedom here before you get here and here after you are gone. Freedom, not you, imprisons you, no choice. Freedom is not knowing why or how freedom imprisons. Freedom breathes only inside you, yet lives somewhere else, not you, that you can't understand. No one understands, but no one's iron barred cell emptied of freedom unless you forget freedom and even forgotten. Freedom's still there when you remember it. Freedom like the unsheddable mystery and burden of yourself. I do not remember the winter coat Omar picked out from Sears, nor remember how he looked in it. Do not remember if I bought him a jacket, too. Do remember Om liked the coat? Sure of that. Recall us both very pleased, happy about the new coat. Ohm put it on, and no matter what the weather outdoors, he wore that coat out of the store. Ohm carrying maybe a big Sears bag or Sears box with his old, probably funky coat balled up in it. Maybe we remember things, bro, because too much always happening to remember. So people make up stuff to, prepend, to pretend they don't forget. Guess that means you could say nothing happens unless there's a story about it. And I guess that's what the Ibu people mean by the proverb Chinua Achebe quotes in Things Fall Apart. All stories are true. I found Pittsburgh Post-Gazette articles on the internet dated November 22nd and 23rd, 1999, reporting that the last of the three men accused of shooting Omar at least five times in the head was found guilty finally of first degree homicide six years after the murder. Another shooter convicted and sentenced in April 1998 had been the one in a fight a knockdown drag out fight with Omar in a Hazelwood bar, a fist fight the man was losing when the cops arrived to break it up and he refused to cooperate with the cops declaring me and my boys will take care of it. What happens in the street stays in the street. Five hours later, around 1.30 a.m. November 8th, 1993, Omar shot to death, and three men in a car arrested, fleeing the murder scene. Two of them are still serving life terms, plus in prison. The third killed in a motorcycle accident just a few months after a jury acquitted him in 1998. The Post-Gazette also reported that in 1993, the year in which Omar was shot, his half-brother Jason had died a month earlier from a bullet in the brain, allegedly the result of a game of Russian roulette. Jason, not your son, bro, but he, did he ever accompany Om and their mom on her prison visits? Jason, the son of a different father, but did he ever come to visit you in prison with his mother and his half-brother, Omar? The year 1993 set a record, 118 homicides in Allegheny County. So many, the paper labeled 1993, the year of death, and noted that black males, 15 to 24 years old, comprised 46 of those Pittsburgh victims. Thank you for the information, motherfucker. I say to the unlucky number 13, flashing at this exact moment on my iPad, 8.13 a.m., March 3rd, 2022. Our mom, so fearful of unlucky 13, she said she had suffered three extra hours of agony holding me in, so I'd be born on June 14, <laughs> not 13. Thank you.
I holler out loud at the iPad when I touch it to start it working and 13 pops up this morning. I often wonder, and you must too, my brother, how does Ohm's mom survive her double loss, her two sons ripped away in a single year? How does she suffer it, bear it, that intelligent, kind woman, that intelligent, wild, beautiful young girl you tell me you loved and who gave love back, you say, puppy lovers head over heels in love once when you all just babies, you said, and now a different love shared I've witnessed in her, in you, bro, love freeing the two of you to continue loving Omar together. Of course, I scoured the internet after R.I.P. Omar stopped me in my tracks on the bridge. No, R.I.P. Omar didn't stop me in my tracks. The words assailed me, sent me running for cover, and consequently from dredging the internet, seeking more information or maybe seeking less, I learn the length, width, history, etc., of the Williamsburg Bridge, average number of suicides per year who leap from it, and I learn Willie B, the name some locals call the Williamsburg Bridge, and learn Michael Kenneth Williams, the actor who played Omar in the TV series Wire, a homeboy, local hero born in Brooklyn, died of an overdose in Williamsburg. So bro, isn't it more, like, more than likely that it's him addressed, Michael Kenneth Williams, Mr. World Famous Omar, and not Omar, my nephew, not Omar, your son, and certainly not your new grandbaby, I have met only once in a picture that his father, my nephew, emailed me. No, uh-uh. Not our missing lost and found boys on that bridge, but Mr. Michael Kenneth Williams, the one whose pretend name, Omar, painted on the bridge. Wouldn't he, bro, Michael Kenneth Williams, be the one up there dead and laid to rest, mourned by a grieving true fan, R.I.P. Omar. I imagine infant Omar lying on his belly, wet and warm. The baby blinks or cries out once in its sleep, that quick, quicker way quicker than outcry or blink. The slave road gone, gone quick, gone, 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 gone. Thank you.
I'm nervous, y'all. I'm nervous. Uh, me and John had a little chat today. He was like, spontaneous conversation, Mitch. I got five pages of questions. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I don't know if you, um, you've been paying attention to this, but I feel kind of weird starting with this, but Beyonce just put out a country album, uh, Cowboy Carter, and there was a lot of, okay, all right, shout out to the Beyonce fans. Um, there was a lot of discourse about whether or not she could put out a country album and who had claim to country as a genre, which to me seems connected to identity. And that made me think about how you explained this book um, and saying, is it autobiography or is it fiction or is it poetry? What is it? And I don't think we often talk about genre in terms of identity, but I was wondering if you see kind of like a, the same kind of connection between who can write a certain genre of writing uh, or fiction or prose or poetry and their identity and then maybe even how that's connected to value. Mm. When I was a young man, I was, I, I was very ambitious. I suppose I'm still very mm -hmm. ambitious. Uh, I didn't want to be a great American writer. I wanted to be a great writer. Yeah. And I probably couldn't even spell the word genre <laughs> when that, uh, that idea went through my mind. Yeah. But I know I wanted to be independent. And I had read lots of writing. I'd read my share at that time in life. Yeah. Uh, I was probably a college student when thoughts like that going through my head. But it's connected. Uh, and it's connected with the concept of, <clears throat> of slave road. <clears throat> because who decides what country is? One decision is to buy a record. Right. If you have the money and you put it down, you, you buy it. But, and there are people who want that money and want you to buy their record. And, and if, if, if calling it country will get you to buy it, they'll call it country <laughs> prime, country <laughs> squared, uh, <laughs> deepest, darkest country, yeah. stone country. They'll do whatever. Yeah. Uh, and far too often, the only reasoning is to get your 39 cents for the, for the record. Yeah. It doesn't have anything to do with their authority, what they, uh, what they care about, what, what country music means to them. Uh, and a crossover, a, in quotes, crossover, like uh, Beyonce's crossover, and here I am talking about something I really don't know anything about. I cannot, <laughs> I cannot read music. I don't, uh, the, the, the year I was supposed to learn to read music, we had Mrs. Blackburn in school. Uh, and our great achievement as a class in Liberty Elementary was to make her cry. <laughs> we could get Mrs. Blackburn to cry. And once we could get her to cry, she sort of left us alone, yeah. and we didn't have to read music. It just, uh, if we came in, were nice to her, yeah. and didn't act like little uh, morons, then she could go home and get through the, anyway, I didn't learn to read music. Okay, okay. Just like I didn't learn to swim, yeah. because all the pools in Pittsburgh were segregated. Mm. Uh, and uh, the ones that black people could go to were so filthy that uh, the one time I, somebody did take me, yeah. I got to the edge and my, my aunt kind of dipped me in the pool. I can see the pool now. She dipped me in the pool and I looked out at the, the water and there was a scum on top of it. Mm. There were roaches floating on it. Mm. And 
I didn't want to go in that water. No. Uh, swimming sounded great. Mm -hmm. But the water didn't belong to me. It did not belong to the city of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. The water was a victim of lots of evil thinking and an evil history mm -hmm. uh, that encompassed everybody. Yeah. And it leaves some of us unable to swim, some of us crossing over and having our, our music classified and put into uh, little boxes. Yeah. And that's not what music is about. It's, it's, it's not about that. But we're trapped. Yeah. And we don't know or we haven't exactly proven that we can get beyond that trap. Yeah. And that's a long way around, I guess, to try to answer your question. Yeah. But we, we're, we're, we, we suffer. We suffer the division that into black and white that enabled slavery. And we suffer the invention of slavery, whether we were the enslavers or the enslaved. Yeah. The invention of slavery may have finished us as a, as a creature, as a human being. Yeah. Um, I know you said in, in, the, in your reading, preface for the reading, that you didn't necessarily want to define slave road. Um, but I am interested in it, and I've, I've read the book, and um, I was, I wondered how you see slave road as different, and I w would argue more expansive and I'm, I'm not saying just the middle passages, if that's a, my small thing, but like it seems bigger than the, 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 the journey or the crucible of the middle passage. So maybe you don't have to explain the full thing, but like how is the slave road different than the middle passage? I'm a writer. I sit around and think about things and then try to write them down and search for language and suffer silence and frustration. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I keep doing it, keep, keep doing it, keep doing it. And somehow I get enough satisfaction that I hope I do it till the day I die. Uh, but I had an image that came to me that if you took all the bodies of Africans that were, in fact, enslaved and imported into South, Central, North America and the Caribbean islands. If you took all those bodies and lined them up head to toe, they would stretch across the friggin' Atlantic Ocean, literally, that chain of bodies. Mm. And for me, that was the meaning of a slave road. Mm. And then the idea opened up for me because it's impossible to talk about the middle passage really, except as a kind of abstract conception. Mm -hmm. But for me, the idea that this chain between Africa and Europe and the Caribbean, etc., was made up of bodies, living bodies, and that you could actually, if you chose to, walk across those bodies to get to the new world, mm. what was being called the new world. And the, that perception, for me, of walking on those bodies, and it was horrific. But I also saw it as much closer to having an understanding of what slavery might have felt like because it was body by body. Mm -hmm. Child, woman, man. So if you want to think about it, if you want to make sense of it, get your feet on that, on their backs or on their bellies and try walking across the ocean on that, uh, that structure. And I, I, I don't know, I could call it a lot of other things. Yeah. And people have 
could estimate, but I know there were enough bodies to make that kind of road. And that's why it's a slave road. Mm. But interestingly enough, the people whose bodies I'm talking about and, and, and the bodies that we have to internally connect with and, 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 and become, become, if we want to really understand our history. These people were not slaves. Right. They were enslaved. Yeah. They were you and you and you and you, people, me, yeah. Mitch. They weren't slaves. They were people who were enslaved. And that is about domination. That is about color division. That is about historical accident. But walk on those backs. Walk through those backs. Walk w with those backs. You can't understand slavery unless you do that. Oh. You write of um, Rebecca, and you talk about her body possibly being buried next to, I think it's Christian? Christian Borg, Fort Christian, Christian Borg. Borg. Fort Christian Borg. So I didn't go to Fort Christian Borg, but I did go to Elmina. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm talking about Ghana. These are slave forts in Ghana. And I went back to Ghana in the year of return, so 2019, and I visited Elmina, or Elmina, maybe I'm saying it wrong. And uh, the thing that, well, a lot of things struck me, but one thing that, that I carried with me was that they had built a church on top of the dungeon. So you could literally be in church and praising God and have people chained in their feces and naked beneath you, which really made me start to ask questions about the role of the church. And you write of at least three missionaries in this book. And I wondered how you see that dissonance between these people who are proclaiming themselves to be holy, but then also are literally on top of Africans who are being enslaved. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I try in my writing to uh, not use too broad a brush. Yeah. I think every case is different. Every individual is different. Uh, my mother was a very religious person. Mm -hmm. I don't respect anybody more than I, I respect her, her, in, in, her intelligence, her knowledge, her ability to deal with other people. Uh, Jesse Jackson's one of the smartest people I've ever, I, I ever met. And he has a religious background. So, and Reverend Felder in our church when I was growing up, uh, Homewood AME Zion Church, uh, he certainly uh, put the fear of God into me yeah. <laughs> uh, with, his, with his fire and brimstone kind of, of uh, sermons and the way he would march and kind of dance and get, get moved by the spirit. I learned from all that, and that's part of me. And I was, I was part of a community. So that outreach gives someone like my brother the strength to invent inside himself the meaning of freedom. Mm -hmm. so, the, so that he has the meaning of freedom inside himself for 44 years while he's inside a literal steel an iron prison, mm -hmm. and it does not break his back. It does not break his spirit. It does not break his will. And the miracle is he comes out determined to help people like himself, not turn his back, not try to escape, not try to go buy a Cadillac or whatever, mm -hmm. not back to drugs, not back to the life, not back to the street. He wants to help people like himself. Uh, now, how's, uh, that's miraculous to me. I, have not, I, I, I respect that so much, and he's not, uh, he's not an exception. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has something to do with spirit, with imagining yourself as more than flesh and bone, imagining uh, a connection with other people that, that, in a weird way, is like walking on their backs 
across the slave road. Mm. They take up space. You take up space. They're, um, you would hear prayers, I'm sure, mm -hmm. if, you, if this imaginary slave road I'm talking about, if we cross. And it wouldn't be the prayers only of the dead. It would be the prayers of the living mm -hmm. who would be walking across. Now, uh, I'm not a religious person mm -hmm. in, this, in, the, in, the, in the sense that I have one denomination. Mm -hmm. And these African-American folk in the 19th century, like Rebecca Proton, like uh, uh, her, her husband, Jacob Proton, uh, and, and many others I could name who, who operated in the very country of Ghana that you visited. Mm -hmm. My son went to, went, went to yeah. Ghana. He's the one who told me about the first, uh, he was the one who informed me about those forts. Yeah. And he's the one who brought to my attention the names of the sometimes half African, half uh, uh, European men mm -hmm. who were chaplains and missionaries in these slave forts. Now, you're talking about the horror of walking around in a, what a pres let's say a Presbyterian church, mm -hmm. in Christianborg, for instance, yeah. in Osu, in uh, Ghana, present day Ghana, and the horror of the slaves naked and beaten and maybe being raped and babies dying underneath your feet. That's pretty awful. And you, and you think that maybe the floor, you know, if there is such a thing as a God, he would not permit that. Mm -hmm. the, the, the floor would, would shake, the building would come down, the, the worlds would, but that's not the way things are. Yeah. Uh, more. The, the, there, there's a famous moment in, in, in uh, uh, Sartre, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting, I'm trying to remember exactly where it is now, but it's, he, has a, uh, he has a play about slavery. Mm -hmm. And one of the missionaries, or one of the slaves is being tortured to, to, to tell us, give up a secret. Mm -hmm. And he's been he's tortured for an hour, an hour. Horrible torture. And they, uh, and he's asked, have you had enough? Mm -hmm. Have you had enough? Mm -hmm. And the answer is more. more. Oh yeah, give me more. You wrote about more the stories, yeah. Uh, in other words, there is something unbreakable. Yeah. And that's something unbreakable in us, that sense of freedom in us has roots in, in the idea of religion. Um. I have never met, I feel I should call him like uh, Mr. Robbie, at least. Uh, I never met your, your brother, but I feel like I know him through your work and he's, he's a part of um, Slave Road as well. Uh, and he makes me think about, uh, I hate this term, the prison industrial complex, but in, in reading about the history of prisons in the U.S., um, I uh, came upon the models of prison, the, the Auburn model and the Pennsylvania model, which is close to home, right? So the Auburn, or the Pennsylvania model being the first one, the uh, people who were in that prison were kept in 24 hour solitary confinement. I've been there, it was an Eastern state. They got like the eye of God up here, a little hole so you can see the sunlight and turn you, sunlight and turn you penitent. And then the Auburn model where uh, the people that were kept there were in cells, but then they had to work during the day and they weren't, weren't able to, um, to, to speak to each other. And uh, I think it's in the, I wanna say it's in the 1850s that America moves away from the Pennsylvania model to the Auburn model. So the, the work model in the day, you, it's, it's more punitive in that way uh, they were making things for other people, so there's a, the, 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 the connection to capitalism in the, in the Auburn system as well. And uh, it made me wonder, what do you think that 
what we have now as a prison industrial complex would look different if we had adopted the Pennsylvania model of penitence in the eye of God and 24 hour sol solitary confinement over the Auburn model. Or if we are both of them just avenues on the slave road, inevitably we kind of end up in the same place. Mm -hmm. I think, we're, I think human beings will continue to make mistakes, grievous mistakes, and we will hurt each other in, in deadly, awful ways. But we will also uh, support and secure, succor one another. And I don't think that's going to stop, no matter what, uh, what prison system we uh, organize. Because you can't, I mean, prison is a pretty awful idea. Uh, whether you think of it as punishment, or, you know, the Quakers thought of it as a, a, a and that's in Pennsylvania as well. In Pennsylvania, the, the, uh, uh, the, the Quakers were in, in, uh, very instrumental yeah. in the development of prisons. And their idea was, well, just shut up, you did wrong, shut up, work hard, and sit around and think about what you did wrong. Yeah. And sooner or later, they had the, they had the belief that, uh, you know, maybe you'd come out a better person yeah. or you would change. And that's how you, you just give people some space yeah. and they'll change. Well, all these ideas are good. Mm -hmm. But as long as um, we're the kind of animal that if there's one apple right there, mm -hmm. and maybe no more apples. Mm -hmm. And Mitch knows that, and I know that. We both can go for the apple. <laughs> we could cut it up. Uh, we, we could, <laughs> but uh, who gets the knife? Right. <laughs> and how do we know that knife is going to be used to, yeah. you know? We love each other, yeah. and we hug, and we trust. Yeah. But I think to talk about the system uh, will continually get us in trouble mm. because they're, they're, it's not about the system. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, what's, what's the solution of, of, of the horrors in, Ga in Gaza? Right. It, it, can anybody figure that out? Uh, we know everybody's doing wrong and wrong is being done and we can't stop ourselves. Mm -hmm. People there can't stop themselves. And they're intelligent, thoughtful prescriptions and ideas, but uh, we, we just, we have, to, we have to hope that uh, if we have prisons, that they don't, do not become a place for warehousing and dividing and making the differences between us even greater. Yeah. If there's anything I say, prisons make the differences greater and then solidify them. Mm. Um, we met, as I mentioned, in New York City. Uh, and you write in Slave Road about New York. You say, I'm paraphrasing, that New York is home to no one. <laughs> <laughs> That it's a, well, let me, let me see if I can find it real quick. I, I thought it, well, let's see, it might take a little bit. Let me see. Oh, damn, it ain't coming up fast enough, y'all. Oh, here, yeah, I found it, I found it. Uh, so it's see? a piece called Here. Yeah. Okay. You say, you call it a city that can abide anybody's company, but refuses everyone, every person's request for refuge. And that made me think about Toni Morrison's uh, definition of home, uh, of home being um, memory and people or companions who share the same memory, uh, which made me think of how much you've written about home. Homewood, you know, um, even, even now writing about New York City. And uh, what would you say is your definition of home, if it's not, if it can't be New York City, is America a home or is it as little of a home to us 
as New York City is to these people who can't get refuge in it and are, are immigrants to it? I don't know, that's a really convoluted question. What's your <laughs> definition of home? <laughs> and how does it compare to Morrison's? Is maybe a straighter way to answer that, ask that. Mm. Uh, home is where you learned to crawl mm. and to move and to speak. Mm. Uh, you, you, you learn that you have a body and you learn where you learn you have a body and it can be satisfied or, or, or made painful. And I think that's, that's what a home does. Mm -hmm. and, it, and that gets me very quickly into notions of movement and dream and music. Uh, home for me is the people who were moving around. Mm. You know, that's literally life, yeah. animation. I saw those folks moving. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned I could move. Uh, you know, home starts, home's about that yeah. kind of stuff. That's why there's so much uh, music. And if you hear, if you might hear prayers on the slave road, I'm sure. God darn sure you'd hear songs mm -hmm. and you'd hear music. You'd hear uh, you'd hear the gospel groups, the gospel singers. Willie Boy got drowned in the deep blue sea. Deep blue sea, very deep. Blue sea, deep blue sea, very deep blue sea, deep blue sea, very deep blue sea. Willie Boy got drowned in the deep blue sea. Yeah. That's country music. That's the blues. Mm -hmm. That's what we carry around in our side, ourselves. That's home. Yeah. Nobody owns it. Somebody tries to tell you what it is. Somebody will patent it. Somebody will make a mockery of it on TV. As you're trying to watch a basketball game, uh, there'd be a bunch of morons sitting around <laughs> in something that looks like a living room and they're supposed to be home. And you, you, know, you just want to scream. Mm -hmm. uh, but one hopes that there is the possibility to, to raise children, that we, that we don't lose that, mm -hmm. and that we get smarter about it. Mitch? Yeah. Uh, I, 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 uh, I was just thinking about um, you leaving um, Pittsburgh, going off to UPenn, and then ending up in, in, at Oxford. And I'm trying to imagine, like, you know, young white men, you've been all league in UPenn, you out there balling, hooping with Bill Bradley, you know, you, you, know, you tall guy, fit guy, you probably having it how you want it out there, and you submit a story to someone, and you write that this, I think it was a professor, says, this is good, Weidman, but go home in your work. Mm. And I wondered what that meant to you. And then, seems like a bit of like, advice that you would carry with you. Was that some of the most impactful wisdom that you'd received about your work? Uh, I had, a, I had a, a Don, an Oxford Don, who was teaching me Chaucer. And he, his wife was a novelist, a world famous novelist. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's a he's decent enough dude. <laughs> and I, 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 I trusted him, so I gave him some of my stories. I was actually hoping he would pass them on to his, uh, to his wife and you know, get some. Uh, you know, I'm a, a, always scheming yeah, the yeah. audience. But, uh, <laughs> 
And they were stories I was, I was writing when I was an undergraduate at Oxford. And what was fascinating to me is to get on the boat, get the hell out of Oxford, go over to Europe, mm -hmm. see the people in Spain, see the people in France, mm -hmm. people, the girls, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the life, the, the cafes, the stuff. Yeah. So I'm writing stories about that. And I, I was influenced by American writers like Fitzgerald and Hemingway mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, all those people who had wrote, written about uh, American writers who had written about living in Europe. And so my stories were probably pretty much uh, butthole kind of imitations of, <laughs> of, of, of what they were doing yeah. and my perceptions of culture and change and difference. and. Uh, uh, what did I think when the man told me to go home mm -hmm. in my work? Go home. He was nice. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, Widen, it's exciting stuff, down and out in Paris and Rome. Whoa. <laughs> he said, but you know, I think maybe you ought to get closer to home. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I was infuriated by that because he was actually telling me I wasn't a great American writer. Mm -hmm. he, was, he, was, he was being bossy, yeah. which was true. Mm -hmm. And then I suddenly thought, well, now why am I, you know, because I was trying to defend myself, obviously. So I'm thinking, is he dissing my stories? And so what the hell does he know? And is he the one who's going to finally judge my story? Yeah. So all that's going through my mind. Um, and I don't know what I said to him at the time. I probably said, thank you, uh -huh. uh, Professor Tolkien. <laughs> uh, and went on about went on about my business, yeah. but then later, yeah. not that much later, because by the time I left Oxford and came back to the United States and went to the Iowa Writers' Workshop, I was writing very different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And the ter some terrible things had happened in my family, yeah. and people were in prison, and people were dying, and the Omars, and the Robbies, and the Jasons, and you know, all that was beginning to impact me, and I knew that's, what I, that's where I had to go. So I understood what the man was talking about, yeah. but it took me a while. Yeah. It took me a while. Yeah. It took me a while. Um, kind of reminds me of a conversation I had with uh, a, a colleague at Arizona State just last week, and uh, we were talking about uh, my, my Sharpton piece, and he's like, yeah, I read it, and you know, Mitch, look, I don't want to be disrespectful. So immediately, you already know, some disrespectful shit disrespectful. is coming, you know? I don't want to be disrespectful, but uh, have you ever thought about, like, writing for a broader audience? And I was like, you mean write for white men? <laughs> uh, and I thought, has anyone ever, you know, like, your, I, I would argue that your writing is universal, but it's universal for its specificity for you writing about your family a lot of the time in home when even though you know you write about going to Martinique and all these other places but mainly we're in New York City and we're in Homewood right as a grounding and I thought has has anyone ever said something like that to you or have you ever thought about audience in the way that your work uh, relates to a certain audience, or do you think more of like, I just do what I do, and the audience finds it? The best, the best way, or the way that gives me the most pleasure to think of my own work is to think of growth mm. and change. And the, the works, the writings, the language, trying to become something other than it is, mm. more than it is. Uh, because there are very few things I understand. And there's so much that I won't ever come to understand and you won't understand. And, and writing for me is that process of discovery. And I'm, I've done enough of it uh, I'm old enough and or whatever that the joy comes when I f figure out something for myself, when I, when I learn something. And that, strangely enough, I think is the best writing, the better writing. 
yeah. when it's and it's asking to become something other than it is, when it wants to break out of what it is, when I'm challenged, when I have to give something up. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's the playground. Yeah. Playground basketball. Yeah. You, you, it gets good when it gets scary. Yeah. When somebody's in your face yeah. and they do their thing, okay. Yeah. <laughs> now we're coming down the other side of the court. And that yeah. guy just made a fool of you. Yeah. And, and, and you're still shaky. Mm -hmm. But now it's your turn. What are you going to do? Yeah. You're going to hide? Or are you going to be stupid and throw up a, a, a bad shot to try to make a... No, no, that... Cope with it. Deal with it. Yeah. Deal with it. You're in prison. You're going to be here for 20 more years. Right. There are people around you who are trying to destroy you. There are people who want to take what you have. There are people you know you've wronged. You've wronged yourself. You're going to get up tomorrow morning. You're not going to have, whether it's sunshine, rain, you're going to be behind these friggin' bars with these other guys, yeah. with the guards. You're not going to be able to help your son. Well, then what do you do? What do you do in child time? Yeah. And somebody bumps you or the food doesn't taste so good. Or, yeah. you know, what are you, going to, what are you going to do? It's not a playground game. Yeah. But it's the same kind of need to uh, get outside yourself. Yeah. Just the possibility of getting outside that little rock that we all live in. Yeah. Um, now you got me thinking about basketball. <laughs> and I was thinking of that analogy you just made. It's even worse when the park is packed and if you lose, you're going to be down like all day. Like you're not getting back <laughs> on the court. <laughs> like, man, how many games on down? Man, you're down 15 games if you lose this game. Now that's real pressure. I was also thinking uh, one of the greatest moments, fulfilling moments maybe in my life was actually when I was in prison and I played basketball. We had like a tournament going and somehow I missed my the first half of my game because I didn't make it from chow to wreck in time. Mm. So then I I come out at halftime of our game. I get the next yard call. I come out. We down 28 points at halftime. And man, I score like 50 points and a half <laughs> in prison. Yeah, I just want y'all to know I, we put that on the record. Uh, 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 Sandy Am Correctional Institution in Salem, Oregon. There's a record, 50 points and a half, and we won. Um, last time we talked, maybe not last time we talked, but one of the times we talked, we were talking about how basketball and the kind of imaginative playmaking and the way that you move in the air is likened to what we aspire to do on the page and is a kind of jazz. And uh, you also mentioned um, in that time that you wanted to create work that made you feel like the garden of earthly delight. So Hieronymus Bosch, the garden of earthly delight. So I, I wanted to know, um, you write about Basquiat in this book. Is there something you see in his work that you are trying to approximate on the page and or what are the kind of analogies from basketball and, and sports that are still working their self out in your work? Well, Hieronymus Bosch made All-American uh, basketball player too. You know, he was, a, he was an All-American in, in uh, uh, Middle Germany back in the day. <laughs> uh, oh, Hieronymus, he had a great jump shot. Um, <laughs> I'm, try I'm trying to put together all these pieces of, of your question. If you, that was a good one. That was yeah, good. If, you, if you walk into my apartment in New York City, there's a, the Bosch is painting 
uh, Garden of Delights, yeah. a big imitate, not the real, not the original, yeah. <laughs> uh, but but a, a nice yeah. poster. So I, the frame is nice. Yeah, you, you see you see that, <laughs> and if you keep walking, you get into my work area, and you see my daughter. Uh, basketball cards. Mm -hmm. She was a good enough player in the WNBA that she had, you know, little cards yeah. of hers. So, you know, you go, th that's it. Yeah. I, I've just been a lucky person. Mm -hmm. I've been exposed to all these things and they have, they're, they're part of me and I can't, uh, when the writing is going well, there's a fluidity and a, uh, a natural uh, kind of reverberation, mm -hmm. so that all this stuff is kind of tingling somewhere beneath the surface, and, and I'm, I'm just surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, I was writing about Chuck Berry the other morning, mm -hmm. and I don't know that much about Chuck Berry, and I, I really never liked his music that much. <laughs> it, it was one of those Beyonce questions, you know, and where does Chuck Berry fit? Is he a black rocker, or is he a white, uh, 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 kind of stealing from the blues and all that. Yeah. But anyway, I read a good book about him and I'm thinking about him and uh, if nothing else, he changed American music. Mm -hmm. He was a cataclysmic force, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting there trying to write a little piece ass poem about <laughs> Chuck Berry and my desk begins to wobble. Oh, the earthquake, yeah. yeah. And I look at my orange juice and it's slopping around yeah. in the glass. And I'm thinking, no, no, he's not that much of a, a game changer. This is, this is crazy. Uh, what are you, your, your poem and now you're... And then, you know, that finally it became clear that yeah. there was an earthquake. Uh -huh. And uh, Chuck Berry, I'm still writing the poem. Yeah. But, they, but it all comes together. Yeah. And it comes together in somebody's good time. Yeah. I won't say her good time yeah. or his good time, mm -hmm. but in somebody's good time, it's all, it's all there. Yeah. The light, the darkness, the, the noise, the craziness, it's all my mind. Yeah. I got two more questions for you. One question, KB, Kathy Belden, editor that we shared, uh, she was publishing your collected and you write about that experience, uh, you say, what would be the point for me or anybody else to be subjected again to inevitable disappointment? Uh, you have now, at this stage, received buku laurels. Um, but I wonder, in that having experienced my, more than my fair share of disappointments in the literary world as well, how have you dealt with career disappointment? Hmm. Um, that's, that's really a small element of the total picture. Mm -hmm. I would like to have made more money mm -hmm. uh, because that would have given me more freedom to, uh, to do what I want to do and to help the people I, I love. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I do, I, I, I and I say this to my students, do it because you love it. Yeah. That's, the only, that's the only reason to, to go through all those changes and, mm -hmm. and, and put yourself through all those changes. And it's the experience. Mm -hmm. uh, writing to me was, has always been as exciting as playing basketball. I, can, I don't play basketball anymore, but I'm not finished with it. Yeah. It's still there in my head, it's in my body, and see it in other people, watch it in my daughter. Uh, and that exchange, being part of that continuous exchange. Mm -hmm. uh, the money part, it's funny. I mean, my friend Percival Everett, he was, uh, he, he's, a, he's a great writer, he's a thoughtful writer, smart man. Uh, my son and my stepson has a big painting by uh, Percival, you know, you don't, uh, Percival's a very good painter, mm. but Percival gave that to Catherine, my wife, long time, Catherine gave it to her son. So, you know, and he's a, he's, he, he's a good man, but I'm mad at Percival. <laughs> I'm really mad at Percival. This is about career. Yeah, yeah. He's having all this friggin' success. 
Mm -hmm. He's in the front of the Times Magazine. He sees uh, his books, uh, the bestseller list, uh, made a movie mm -hmm. of, uh, of one of his books. Uh, Percival, how come I was trying to buy your new book <laughs> on internet and somehow your people got me to buy the audio book too? <laughs> Don't you have enough money? <laughs> Don't you get an, hasn't all this success? Yeah. No, no, you, now your friend has to pay that $14.95 for the audio book that I'm never going to listen to. Yeah. So yeah, I, you know, you can't help but compete. Yeah. <laughs> if you're a basketball player, you, you compete. Yeah. And I'm aware of the numbers, mm -hmm. and sometimes it gets me down, mm -hmm. but, uh, it won't stop me from writing. That won't change anything. Yeah. All right. Last question. Uh, you write at the beginning of Slave Row, kind of joking, that this is an autobiography. You're playing with the ideas of what genre is this? Should you believe it? Should you not? Um, and I've, and I think you even say this too, or a version of this, that we're basically always writing our autobiography. And if that is the case, and I guess you can even think about this in the terms of all stories are true, if we're always writing our autobiography, which parts of your autobiography do you feel most compelled to write going forward? Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm discovering my life story. Hmm. I'm in the midst of discovering it. That's what's exciting to me. Yeah. And in those very terms, here you sit, uh, uh, a, a very good writer, and uh, in, in, in the midst of your career and doing many different things, uh, and you've devoted some time to just sitting here and kind of picking through my stuff and talking to me. Um, and I think it's very, it's, it's very generous of you. And I'm, I'm, I'm very touched that we, uh, that we're having this moment, which is both of our stories. Mm -hmm. And I hope people, when they hear your questions, know that you have as rich and as uh, lively and as intelligent a set of answers as you could possibly prompt from me. Mm. I think that's it. Thank you all for coming. We'll see y'all out there if you buy one of his 30 books. Good time. Thank you for coming. Ah. That was great, man. Creek, 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 creek. Yeah.